So hello, Cardiff undergraduates. Um, I'm just messing around with this, seeing if I've actually got it recording. Obviously not very tech friendly myself, despite running a tech company. So I understand this week you have been doing um, SLA, Second Language Acquisition Theories, and then you've been forced to do a certain amount of Say Something in Welsh, um, which obviously I think is a great idea. Um, some of you will have suffered more than others with that. Some of you may feel so um, unhappy about the experience that I'm glad I'm doing this remotely and virtually. Um, others may have found it enjoyable. Um, I hope at least some of you did. And the purpose of this little video is to tell you um, why we think it works, so what we're trying to do and how it does or doesn't fit into the, the standard um, theoretical background of, of SLA. So you, you'll have gone through your sort of six or seven major theories um, and you may already have realised that one of the reasons you're being given this slightly tricky challenge to figure out where we fit in is that we just don't fit in very easily to any of them. Um, you can make arguments for, for one or two and there are elements of what we do the, that you might see fit in. But broadly speaking, we think we're doing something slightly different. And the, the main thing we think is different about it is if you if you look across the, the scope of second language theory, what you'll see broadly speaking is that there's um, a very, very established consensus that to, to acquire language, you have to acquire words and you have to acquire some kind of grammatical schema. Um, and most of the theoretical differences really are about the ways in which you acquire that schema. What is the most effective way to get to the stage where you can then produce utterances in the target language? Um, so we don't think that's what's actually happening though. So we think the, the language um, production itself is actually, um, it's an emergent property and the language acquisition also is an emergent property. Um, you probably want to cover this. Um, emergent properties uh, are things that arise out of, out of complex adaptive systems. Um, so if you're looking for sort of background on this, it's, it's chaos theory, complexity theory, going back to kind of the mid eighties. Um, the way in which patterns arise um, in what appear to be extremely complicated ways, which often have very simple initial conditions. So things like the, the shape of a leaf or, or a snowflake or, or the way in which geese fly. So what we think language arises out of is two very simple initial conditions. We think you, you have to learn the words. Of course, you can't get away from that. We know that learning words on its own isn't enough though. So how do you solve for the issue of ability to, to create, to produce in the target language if it's not a grammatical schema? Well, we think it's just about the information that is carried in the gap between two words. So when you hear two words together, we think your brain encodes some information about the fact that those two words fit into each other. If you think about this at a, a neurological level, then um, actually as soon as you start talking about, about where the neurological structures would be for a grammatical schema, it, it gets a bit complicated, it gets a bit messy quite, quite quickly. Um, is the brain creating sort of um, synaptic links and, and neurological connections um, that, that run through a sentence while at the same time going off and doing some sort of parallel processing about the, the type of the word and, and what the grammatical structure calls for next. Um, we think that's probably overcomplicated to the point of being unrealistic. We think the brain just, as, as it usually does, it forms um, neurological clusters um, and it, it has synapses or patterns of neurons leading to other neurological clusters. So when you get, um, for example, you get, so your brain has a neurological cluster for the word you, a neurological cluster for the word get, and it has a connection between the two. So you can go from you to get fairly easily. It it's, it's, doesn't feel like a difficult thing to do. If you ask somebody to say something like um, uh, you walking, which we don't really have a connection for, we can go and use both those words, but the strength of connections isn't there. So you, if you think about it as individual neurons, you could say there isn't a synapse between you and walking because those two words don't fit together. So what we believe is that if you give a learner enough uh, exposure to these patterns of language, if, if they get a, a collection. So if, if somebody, for example, learns 10 or 20 words 
you know they're not going to have a lot of uh, productive capacity in that language. But if they learn 10 or 20 words, and they learn three or four connections between each of those words, then suddenly you find that people can produce quite a lot and they can become um, fairly early stage playful with their, their use of language. And, and that gives them often a sense of confidence um, and makes them realize that they're, they're learning faster than they expected they, were, they would learn. So, so this is what we're always trying to do. We're trying to make sure that our learners get exposed to um, a core number of words but then a very high number of different edges between words. So we don't want you just knowing that you can plug you into get. We want you to know that you will also plug into you want, you need, um, you had, you said, um, a range of, of useful bits of vocabulary that you then start to sense these things are options for me that can come after the word you. Um, so what this does then in terms of our methodology when you take away the need to explain a grammatical schema to train somebody to be able to make these very conscious decisions about grammar, um, you actually save yourself a huge amount of teaching time. So your, your, your teaching time then can focus almost entirely on the process of acquiring vocabulary and getting exposed to the edges between vocabulary. So um, a couple of other things just came to my mind, but I'll, I'll get to them later. Once you know that this is what we're trying to do, that we're just trying to do these two things. We want you remembering words and we want your brain becoming sensitized to the way in which those words fit into other words. That tends not to happen at the level of the conscious mind. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons sometimes that this, this process can feel more difficult um, than, the, than it would be nice if it did. It would be lovely if it just felt really, really easy for everybody. Um, but because the edges aren't really something you sort of have a conscious control of, you can feel very confident. If you know 100 words, you can say, oh, I've learned 100 words. But you're never at a point where you can say, I'm now sensitized to 500 edges. It just doesn't happen. So what we're always trying to do is create memories for the words and memories for the edges. That's fundamentally all we do in, in terms of the, uh, the productive lessons, the ones that you've tested so far. Um, so the way in which we're doing that then is based on um, not so much on, on second language theory, it's based on research into, into memory formation. And there's a lot of very interesting and, and very, um, very well developed um, research work on, on patterns of memory formation. And, and we understand it, you know, we understand it at a synaptic level. We, we know about um, the ways in which neurotransmitters impact on it. We know about the ways in which um, the ways in which synapses can be strengthened or can be weakened. Um, oh, I've just got a child walking in here, like that famous BBC clip. So I might need to, yeah, both teach you, Karyad. So then now. My mum had only had him in the back, he's wearing a couple of Okay, with you now, Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, that's just me getting company, the, the joys of homeschooling. Um, so, where was I? I was, uh, right, how do we form these memories? Now, the, the four main techniques we use, which are absolutely, rock, I mean, these are very, very, very proven approaches. Um, number one is a is a very common concept that, that is, is widely known, spaced repetition. Um, there, there are a lot of websites out there using that in different ways, like Memrise. Um, Duolingo uses a certain amount of spaced repetition. Um, we've got a slight twist on that, which I'll, I'll come back to later on, um, but that's part of it. So you'll get introduced to something, you'll get a few chances to use it, and then you won't need to use it again for a while, and you'll have to come back to it later on. And that process um, actually ties into the next thing. That process can feel a little bit difficult. You, you want the comfort of just going over and over and over again, but it's much better, it's much more effective, and it takes, in the long run, less work if you do spaced repetition and you leave the gap, the gap becomes longer every single time. This is actually an extremely good method for um, acquiring large bodies of just textual knowledge. So when you're preparing for an exam, if you read and reread a text, you'll actually end up with less control over it than if you extract the core items of information, stick them on flashcards and, and do a quick run through the flashcards once every day, then every couple of days, then every three, four, couple of weeks and, and so on. So space repetition, first big thing. Um, then the second thing is a concept that's um, it's been popularized by uh, a guy called Dr. Robert Bjork in the University of California, and it's called desirable difficulty. 
Um, and this is very, very interesting. We're, we're doing some work at the moment um, with uh, uh, with a football manager, I'm not meant to name right now, um, on using this theory in his work. Um, and this is about how we learn best when we're actually learning. And we tend to we tend to get this wrong. We tend to think that we're learning when we feel in control. But actually, we're learning at our best when we feel slightly out of control. So we talk about the, the 10 percent or the 15 percent going 10 or 15 percent beyond where you feel comfortable. That's where you get the best learning results. So if something's easy, you're not actually getting any better. So if I ask you to say a word in Welsh now and you say it and then I ask you again and again and again and again, you're starting to automate that process and your brain isn't making the encoding efforts it needs to, to form the deeper memories. So actually, after you've done a few repetitions of it, the repetitions become largely useless. But when you create some kind of a structure, so like our way of, of mixing things up and then leaving them for a while, so the spaced repetition eventually gets to the point where a word that you could say five minutes ago now isn't there. You can't get it straight back. And that makes it a little bit more difficult and that means that effort is then encoding a stronger memory. So what we're seeing is that over time you will then learn better because you've been forced to struggle a little bit harder for it. Um, so the third thing then is um, it's a, a learning pattern called interleaving. Now Generally, we feel that if we practice the same thing over and over, we're going to get better results. And if we practice lots of different things, we're going to get worse results. Um, and that makes a lot of sense and it's very intuitive and it's completely wrong. And there's plenty of material on this. So the, the, the classic test for this is you get uh, you form a, a group, group of kids into two groups um, and you're going to test them on throwing a beanbag into a bucket that's three feet away. So group A practices by throwing a beanbag into a bucket that's three feet away, which is the obvious thing to do. Group B practices by throwing a beanbag into a bucket that's two feet away, then into a bucket that's four feet away, and then two, then four, then two, then four. They never throw twice to the same bucket. Um, just realize you can't see all my hand actions here, of course. They never throw twice into the same bucket, and they never throw into a bucket three feet away. Now then you measure those two groups, you test them, you, you take them and you get them throwing into a bucket three feet away. And three very interesting things happen. First of all, the group that have been throwing into a bucket two and four feet away, who've never thrown into a bucket three feet away, they do better consistently every time, which is counterintuitive, but you might have seen it coming or I wouldn't have been telling the story. But the second thing, which is even more interesting, is if you ask the two groups before they do the test which group is going to do better, group A, who've been practicing throwing into a bucket three feet away, believe they will do better. Group B, who haven't thrown into a bucket three feet away, also believe group A will do better. And they're both wrong, but they both believe it consistently. But then the third thing, which is my favorite, after they've taken the test, but before they've had the results, if you ask them the same question, they still believe the same thing. Both Group A and Group B believe that from what they've seen of the test, Group A have outperformed Group B. So their expectations are so strong that they can't even recognize reality. So it's only when they get told what their scores were that they realize Group B has outperformed. So why does this happen? What's going on here? It seems to be that the brain is very quick to automate. So when you throw into a bucket three feet away, your first couple of attempts, your brain's working hard and it's trying to get it right. Then once it's got it right or nearly right, it's just kind of automating the process and repeating over and over. From that point on, you then get a lot of information which tells you you're successful. Look, they're all going in over and over and over. But your brain is actually not getting better at the skill of throwing a beanbag to a specific place. The people who are doing two and four, by contrast, are making far more mistakes, so they feel much less successful, but they're also working harder every single time. Their brain is not settling down into a repeating pattern. So if you think about this then in the context of what you've done with, say, something in Welsh, you'll realize that we're changing the structures on you all the time. We never let you just go, 
I went, you went, he went, she went, we went, you went, they went, never. There's never any kind of pattern to the flow. And that's incredibly important. It's because there isn't a pattern that your brain has to be at maximum effort for every single new prompt. Um, so that's interleaving. And interleaving is, is it's fascinating because, because people don't feel as if it works. People making mistakes feel as if they're doing something wrong and they should stop and go and find something where they don't make mistakes. Um, but I've just had um, about five weeks now of working one on one with somebody who's going to be part of a, a television program about learning Welsh. Um, and, and he was absolutely fantastic because he was really struggling early doors. The very first time I met him, he said, look, I'm on challenge three and it's not working, mate. I'm going to let you down. It's not going to be a success. Um, he's now f a little bit less than five weeks later is on, um, I think, challenge 15 of level two. So he's done 40 half hour challenges by embracing the fact that he's meant to be making mistakes and he's really thrown himself into that. As a result, he's now using quite a lot of communicative Welsh and we're pretty proud of, of how he's gonna look when he gets on screen. So the last thing then, and this, this is also very, very important, is um, speed, of, um, speed, of, speed of marking, speed of assessment, the speed with which you find out if what you did was right or wrong. So one of the things which actually makes learning very difficult in, in a un university and in a school environment is that you quite often don't get to know about how well you did. And possibly even weeks later, you, you hand a paper in and it could, be, it could be a fortnight, a month before you get it back. Um, by which stage the effort and, and the thought that you put into making it is, is, is long gone. It's not really front of mind for you anymore. Um, by contrast, when you're learning to drive a car, the very second you start to go wrong, you know all about it. You start to hear the uh, unpleasant sound of your wing mirrors scraping against the wall. You get very fast, immediate feedback. Um, and this is why um, lots of people who don't get anywhere near managing to go to university, um, people who are bottom set for everything all the way through school, can still actually drive cars without, on the whole, having accidents. And it's the speed of feedback. So obviously with us, you get immediate feedback as well. As soon as you've made an attempt to say the, the phrase, then you immediately hear what we were aiming for. And, and your brain all the time is comparing. Um, and this kind of, this leads me on to mistakes. Mistakes is another really interesting issue. People feel so negatively about them. Um, but there are only actually two kinds of mistakes um, when you're producing in a new language. There's a mistake that you don't notice and they happen quite often, particularly in the beginning, because you're focusing so hard on other things, you don't notice you've left a word out, usually. Um, and that doesn't matter at all. Doesn't cause you any pain, doesn't cause you any interruption, and it's not really a problem in the learning process. Then there's a mistake that you notice. So you say it one way, and then you hear it another way, and you think, oh, and you want to kick yourself if you're close to learning it. Um, and the, the, the silly thing is, because we always feel bad about these, you know, we really shouldn't feel bad about that kind of mistake. Because what's happening when the brain notices the difference, you could just as legitimately say that is the actual moment of learning. So when you notice a difference between what you said and the model, your brain has just encoded more information about that and you've just become more likely to get it right next time. But instead of thinking, great, I noticed a mistake, that means I'm learning. We think I made a mistake, that means I'm doing badly, which is just fundamentally wrong. It's, it's not what's actually happening. Um, there's another thing in here about, about the way in which memory is formed. We tend to think, and this gets really drummed into us at school, that memory is binary. Either, you've, either you can remember something or you can't remember it, it's on off. Um, and that's simply not reality. That, that isn't how it works. That's not what's going on here at all. Memory is a process of encoding. When you, when you encounter something, something new, your brain encodes a certain amount of information about it. Then every time you encounter it after that, your brain encodes more information. The very first time you hear a word, you might only encode how many syllables there are in it. And then the next time you might get a little bit of a phoneme, then you might get a little bit more until eventually you've got the word. So if you think of that, I'm going to try and make sure I get this right for the camera. If you think of that as being like the C, you start off at the bottom and eventually encoding and revisiting gets you to the top. And then you bob up and down for a while, which is frustrating. Then eventually you lock in. Now, the, the fascinating thing about this is that the whole way up, 
you're not conscious that you're getting closer to the surface. You just know, I don't know this word yet. So even when you're right here, right up at the top, you've almost done all the learning you need to, your brain is still telling you, I don't know this word. So that's quite disheartening. And it's only when you bop up, there, up, when it bubbles up here, you start to think, oh, I'm getting somewhere. But you're getting somewhere all the way up here. Now, what's the one thing that gives you a clue as to where you are on that journey? Well, it's frustration. So when you hear a word for the new time, if I, if, I say you, if I say to you, what is the Welsh for humidity? You don't know unless you're a Welsh speaker. In fact, actually, if you're a Welsh speaker, you maybe don't know anyway. It's not exactly a commonly needed word here. Um, so I say that to you, you don't know it, and you don't feel any kind of negative emotion about that. You just think, why is he asking me the Welsh for humidity? I don't need to know that. But if I could ask you a Welsh word that was just up here, you can almost remember it, but you haven't quite got there, then you'd look as if you were feeling pain. You'd start to make faces. You go, oh, ah, ow. And then if you don't get it and you hear it, you show a pain reflex. You go, oh, of course, damn it, I should have got that. And you want to kick yourself. But isn't that crazy that when you're feeling the pain and the frustration, is only when you're so close to getting it, you've almost finished the journey. So every time you feel frustrated about a mistake, you should be taking that as a sign that you're learning very successfully. And this is what we see is when people who, who uh, use this method, when they accept the idea that noticing a mistake is the moment of learning and that feeling frustrated about not getting something right shows that you're very close to learning it, then we get people who can just hammer away at full speed and do, um, as this guy I've been working with has just done, 40 odd lessons in five weeks and, and see quite dramatic results. So, um, yeah, that's me over 20 minutes. And that is pretty much the core of what we're doing. We do some other stuff later on with some accelerated listening games, which are rather fun. Um, but that's the core. And I think you can unpick that. And then in your essays, you can probably talk about how some of the stuff fits in to SLA theory, but some of it is simply about memory research. So I hope you find that helpful and good luck with your finals.